Hi, I'm Betty McClellan. In this fifth and final interview with Pauline Woodbridge, coordinator of the North Queensland Domestic Violence Resource Service, I'm interested to get Pauline to cast her eye around Australia and discuss, even evaluate, current responses to domestic and family violence. Then I'll take time right at the end to ask Pauline to share with us some of her thoughts and uh, dreams about the future. In an earlier interview, Pauline, you spoke about the interest shown by Australian governments over the years, both state and federal, in terms of surveys, task forces, actual legislation. But as I see it, there's very little consistency. Politicians seem to go hot and cold on the issue of domestic and family violence. Currently, though, here in Australia, there seems to be an unprecedented political interest. And I wonder what that's all about. Do you have any thoughts about that? But it'd be really nice if we could say that this is a natural progression from all of the work that's been done by feminist activists, by uh, campaigns that have been operating around Australia and globally as well, to put the issue of violence against women on the, on the agenda of um, our governments. And that has been patchy, you certainly mentioned that, that there's times when you think, oh, there's a bit of hope here, we get a new little bit of legislation or maybe a new service funded. Or there's other times when you think, how come our message isn't getting through at all, which means we have to persist. But it, in some ways it is incremental. There is times when there is a development that, makes, that moves us on in a big way. So the Queensland Domestic Violence Task Force report certainly plays that role. So 140 recommendations that have come out of all the consultations that the task force have done across Queensland, talking with victims and talking with police and courts and so on. They've gathered all that information together. They're presenting it to our new government and our new government will respond with um, new services, new legislation and some active ways of working on um, stopping violence against women. So even though it might not seem like a nice smooth progression, that certainly is a bit of a stepped progression in lots of ways. We still have women who come into this service who see our crisis workers and they say, oh, it's just fantastic that you've got this service. I wish there'd been something around like this when my mum went through this. So we know that we can measure that there has been improvement. And our safety upgrades is a really good example where We've had a philosophy that says, why should women and children leave their home because the perpetrator's behaviour makes it unsafe to stay at home? And so um, therefore we uh, now have services that say, well, let's make the home safe for the, the victims, the women and children, and let's deal with the perpetrator outside the home. So we certainly have developed some new responses. There is a way to go. I think the media uh, needs to really tidy up their... their uh, backyard around the way they report domestic violence, especially the deaths of women in domestic violence. There's a, still a long way to go with those sorts of aspects. But I think we're in a good place as well. There's certainly uh, optimism for what's going to come out and what's going to happen in Queensland in the next year or two. Now, here in Australia, there are so many strong women leaders in the fight against domestic violence. And like you, Pauline, they have never given up the fight. They continue speaking out, continue working to achieve the goal of safety for women and children. I know we don't have time for you to comment on each and every one of those of your colleagues around the nation, but maybe you'd like to mention a few of the ongoing projects they're involved in. <laughs> Well, speaking from close to home, we do, you know, our domestic violence office in Mount Isa was managed for a long time by a very special woman, Shirley, who was a rural and remote worker who worked tirelessly in the, the Northwest Gulf region. And um, through her experience and the, and the information uh, that she gained by working in that field, she was well sought out by governments and consultants consultations and researchers and so on, for her to add her expertise to the, uh, to the uh, information gathering that they were doing for various projects and so on. So even ourselves have got, you know, a very significant woman who has added to the body of knowledge. And so 
You're right about you know, your thoughts range around the very, very many impactive women. So in southern Queensland we had women like Betty Taylor who just led the field so well, manager of the um, Gold Coast Domestic Violence Service for many years and then became a trainer around domestic violence issues and so on. So she's had a huge impact in the domestic violence sector as well. We can look at people, the writers like Jocelyn Scott who wrote about the legal aspects of violence against women and people like Dale Spender who really raised our awareness of the, um, the feminist analysis of the relationships between men and women around our language and the way we look at the world and the way we socialise. So they're very important women. And all of those, many of these women have set up very important uh, networks and organisations that really do have an impact. So if we mention WESNET, Women's Services Network, which is a peak body for all of the domestic violence network uh, services in Australia, they have been able to influence government policy at a very high level uh, over the years, depending on which government is listening at the time. And they also auspice a waiver, um, the Australia Violence Against Women Alliance that also informs government and works with the other alliances and also works on the international level around the violence against women issues. So there's just so many uh, women and so many layers that we can talk about that have had an impact and who really have made inroads and influenced um, our work and our shared work and our shared commitment is to actually stop violence against women. So there is some philosophies that say you'll never stop it. There's ideas that well, the best we can ever do is reduce it. But there's still many of us who go back to that original premise that was held by the early women's shelters that said, when we stop domestic violence, there'll be no need for these services. We can close up and go away. Sadly, we're a long way from that happening, but we still hope that we will get there. Okay. Now I'll look to the future before we finish. You, Pauline, were on the committee that developed and recommended a 20-year plan for tackling domestic and family violence starting in 2009. And thankfully, the federal government signed off on that wonderful plan. Um, it, it is a remarkable plan as I read it. Um, has it begun to have an impact, do you think, um, and will it have a long-term impact? It, will it have the long-term impact that the committee hoped it would have? It was an amazing experience to be part of the National Council that worked on the recommendations in that plan. There were such high hopes for it as well, and it was um, presented in a way that there was three-year tranches so that various um, parts of the plan could be dealt with over these three year periods and then new funding would flow for the second one. And we're currently in the second national plan as, as we speak. So the first um, plan, many new services grew out of that and, and the establishment of the plan as being a very important guidance document for the Australian Government. It was agreed to under the COAG process, the Coalition of Australian Governments have all signed up to it and are committed to it and each state and territory have to uh, have certain obligations to uh, provide services and feedback to the Australian Government about what they're doing under the national plan. So it has a big impact from that point of view. I think the very existence of the plan gives so much hope to all the service providers who have been working on this work to the activists who are so keen to see us really tackle and make domestic violence as a, an, a, an average activity in Australian society disappear. And, but it also encourages other countries. And so Australia has been very active with Papua New Guinea, Samoa and places in our immediate Pacific, Asia Pacific region about their need to have a serious response to domestic violence and to develop their own national plans. And very shortly I'll be going to the United Nations for the Commission of Status of Women who are looking at what's going on globally around a range of issues for women and girls, including violence. And we will be working with the Canadian Women's Network, Women's Shelters Network, who are, very, who are very active in Canada about Canada getting a national plan. 
So there's the local level, the guidance that it gives our governments, the guidance it gives us as workers, the hope it gives us as workers, but also it does set a bit of a benchmark for other countries to do better for women and girls in their own countries. So it's very impactive from that point of view. So we do have services that have been set up. We have uh, uh, some new national services that help inform the Australian government. The, new, the second national plan that we're in at the moment has a very strong uh, focus on early intervention and on some very big marketing campaigns to educate people that the violence is wrong and that it must be stopped. So again it can seem like quite an incremental journey to um, make some real changes. And changes are made. In different states um, respond in different ways at different times depending on the political climate. And we used to often look to, from Queensland, we would often look at the other states. But it's a great moment now where we can look to Queensland on the cusp of making changes here that will be incremental and that can build on what's been learned in the other states and territories and what the national plan was looking for. And we can really go forward. And so when people talk about you know, Queen Australia with its responses to domestic violence and they can say, and in Queensland, they do this and they do that and they're actively working towards stopping violence against women. It's a great time to be involved and to be in this state and to be working in this issue that really needs to change. It needs to change quickly because while it doesn't change, women and children are being hurt. All right then, the final question, Pauline. I want to ask you about you personally. Are you feeling positive about the future? Well, you obviously are from the answers you've given us, but I want you to focus on the future in this answer. After all these years, 30 years working in this field, um, do you have any ideas that you want to share with others about the way forward that cause you to feel hopeful? I think some of the things that we've been talking about, the, the fact that this does, you know, the whole area of domestic violence, awareness and knowledge and responses is developing all the time. Having these conversations with you, Betty, have given me a chance to think about those 30 years that I've been working in this field and can look back and see highlights where things have changed. I, look, I can look back and see times when you think nothing's ever going to change. But I do look forward to the future because I think perhaps the time for domestic violence has come and that it will, there will be change. If all, whatever change happens, we can never go back to the ignorant days where it was actually okay for men to do this to their partners in the privacy of their own home. That's one thing we can be confident of. We can never go back to that. All we can do is ever from there go forward. The whole issue of preventable deaths, that's such a strong message, is every domestic violence death is preventable. And so putting a whole range of systems in place to uh, examine every death so that we can close the gaps and do better and prevent um, each, you know, preserve each woman's life. And to preserve each woman and children's life in a way that upholds their rights as human beings in, in this country. Um, all of those things are absolutely possible. It's obvious from this YouTube that my 30 year journey has meant that I've added 30 years to my age. And I'm always, I'm, I'm very eager that we make some real changes before I drop off my perch or, um, and I'm encouraged by uh, the Australian government saying it wants people to work into their old age because I have every intention of going for as long as I can and hoping and working very hard to bring about some real change. And future generations of women will carry on that fight, of course they will, but we hope that it'll be a different fight. It'll be a fight of far less vulnerability far less overwhelming numbers of women treated in this way and far less children growing up in a, you know, in, a, in a way that enables them to either be victims of violence or to perpetrate that violence. So the future will look different. Already what we, where we are now at this time is different from where we were 30 years ago. And we have to just, I think it's a great chance to look back and recognise that and celebrate that and to look forward very positively to the future 
of women and children in Australia living safe, happy and independent lives. Thank you so much, Pauline. This has been so good. All of these interviews, five interviews we've done, and uh, it's been just great, so thank you. I want also to thank two remarkable young women, Jerry Polovich and Angela Burrows, for their technical assistance throughout these interviews. They have worked so hard, and we, Pauline and I both, thank them very much. I'm Betty McClellan signing off.